Hey everyone, I'm Lou Perez, your host of the Builder Upper Show, a podcast where we talk about everything in construction and trades. Now let's get into it. I would like to welcome our guest, Henry Nutt the Third, pre-construction executive at Southland Industries. Henry, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Lou. Uh, thanks for having me today. Looking forward to the conversation with you. Absolutely. So I wanted to jump right into it. I'm really thrilled that you made the time to come here. Yeah, I I, am, I appreciate you having me and definitely looking forward to the conversation. And yeah, I know we've had, I was traveling and keynote speaking across the country, literally. So it was, it was pretty cool. But I, I appreciate you being patient, you know, and definitely looking forward to, because um, I was looking forward to coming here, but glad we finally got made it happen. Absolutely. I, I checked out your LinkedIn. I saw the speaking engagements. You're a keynote speaker. You're a super impressive speaker. I wish I was as good as speaking at you, as you are. Uh, but yeah, really impressive background. So with all that said, I know everybody's wondering, who is this guy? You know, who does on the show? How did he get into construction? That's why I want to jump right into it. Henry, how did you get into construction? Well, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting story because I can't tell you that I was aspiring to be any type of construction professional as a young person. Uh, I wanted to be an engineer. Um, I had a father that was in the trades and he's a sheet metal worker and owned a, owned a business for about 10 years as well. And he would continue. When I graduated from high school, I was going to a community college, going to be a mechanical engineer. And, and while I was going to school, he was hey, the test is coming up. You should take this test. And I would ignore him or I'm focused <laughs> that I got, I'm doing what I'm doing. And one day he just kind of put it in a way that just made sense. Just, hey, just take the test. If you don't want to do it, don't do it, but just take it. So how do you argue with that? You know, so I, I, I ended up taking the test and I had a whole routine. I was going to school during the day, working at night and commuting, you know, and doing my thing. And so I took this test and about two weeks later, I got my results and said, you're in and we need you to start like now. And so <laughs> I'm thinking like, oh, great, you know, and, and so I really had to kind of sit down and make a lap decision. I was working at a retail store, going to community college and and all of a sudden my life was going to change overnight. And and so obviously I, I, I took the jump and I, I began going to school for sheet metal. And I uh, was a pre-apprentice only for a short time and got indentured as, a, as an apprentice in October of 1987. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a great journey in the early stages of it, but, you know, I have no regrets, but it was definitely tough when I got first started. Uh, but I definitely uh, attribute all that to, to my father making that decision or at least encouraging me to at least consider it. And, and so the rest was really history, but it really started with my dad kind of badgering me in the beginning. Oh, I love that. I love that. And your your dad was the pivotal moment to push you to construction. So tell me a little bit about your dad. Yeah. So uh, I have to first start and say that my, my dad recently passed just a, April so of sorry. this year. Mm. Thank you. Um, and But he was definitely instrumental in, 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 in me being who I am today. You know, as far as uh, my father always was an example of a man that that went to work. Um, sometimes he had more than one job, even before he got into the trades, raising us. I have three sisters. And so uh, got the, got a chance to see a person that really what I really now understand as being a developing a strong work ethic. And when you're a kid and you can watch a parent get up and go to work every day, get up early in the morning. Um, prepare themselves and and then come home in the evening. You know, you just you just don't know the impact that that was, was going to have. And my dad would not only do that, but he's changing the brakes in the car, and I'm outside helping him. Not because I wanted to, but because he made me go out there. And, <laughs> you know, uh, my dad was a great cook, so he would like really like to bake and and and, and kind of compete with my mother at the time. And they both could cook great. But my dad was more like a specialist with it. And 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 so I, I was kind of forced to learn that as well, you know. And so he's changing the brakes and working on stuff in the house, but also cooking and baking bread and doing all this stuff that you just wouldn't normally see, I don't think. And but it was my normal, you know. And, and so mm -hmm. I really learned to appreciate it more as I got older 
when I'm driving my vehicle that I had when I was, say, 18, 19 years old, and I could go and do a tune-up for my car, or change my brakes, and my friends couldn't. You know, I, I realized how much uh, what he instilled and what he exemplified as my father and, and showed me that how, how much of an impact that would make. And I, I was able to carry that, you know, into my career. How do you feel like that even impacted you in your own life today outside of work? Do you feel like that push to help others in that and push them in the same direction? Yeah, I mean, in that direction is, you know, wherever that might take them, you know, and it, it's, it's really understanding that not everyone had the opportunity or the luxury or, or just the being, being blessed with having a parent that would exemplify a better version of yourself, mm -hmm. um, something that was going to help you succeed in life, something that may have felt really hard and challenging, but then you learn to appreciate it as you got older because you find yourself in a position where you have, you have some tools in your tool belt that you can access that you just you didn't read it in the book at that point. You, you saw it every day and it becomes your own habit. So I definitely recognize that that, that is not common. And, and it's part why I wrote a book about it in regards to just how you create success for yourself by the fundamental things that both of my parents did just by showing up every day to be my parent. And, and I know that's not necessarily a given for every family that they have people in their lives that they can see what's the best route to take just by recognizing and seeing someone's life that is that close to them. So it's really propelled me um, by the work that we've done here at Southland and partnering with workforce development organizations in our community to really go and talk to those people that are looking to get into the industry, but they may know how to like use a hammer and use a specific tool but they may not know how to show up with the right behavior that's going to keep them a job that can grow into a career. And, and so it's not a secret sauce, but it really is kind of secret. It's, it's not <laughs> like, but I, what I'll say is like common sense isn't common. And, and I learned that um, with the exercise of writing this book and thinking that no one's going to read this. Everyone knows this already because I thought that's common knowledge. Mm. But it's not, you know, and, and so I, but it's one of the reasons why I became this advocate and a spokesperson for things that uh, designed to help people overcome, um, understand how to navigate through hardship um, and recognize some of their own thoughts, looking in the mirror and being able to like say, hey, I got to change here because they may not have had that talk. They may not have had that example. They may not have had an uncle or, or an aunt or a mother that was was involved to that degree of their lives where it's helping them shape the you know the rest of their lives with the decisions that they make and and, and so forever grateful for for that from from both of my parents but specifically having a having a man in my life that I identified with as a young man um, showing that example uh, was very impactful can you think about any quotes or sayings that your dad would say to maybe get you through a, a tough time or maybe a story that you'll remember? One of the things that my father, that's a great question. Luke. My, my father always told me, um, I want you to think. Nice. He, he always encouraged me to, to not be persuaded by the crowds. He would make examples of uh, driving down the block and seeing young people doing wild, crazy stuff. And he would make jokes like, are you doing that? And, you know, and, and like, it wasn't our style, you know, it wasn't what we did. But he, he'd be that kind of person that would say, think, you know, and, 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 and really challenge you to, to not just be caught up in the moment of what everyone else is doing and, and how you show up every day um, using your own brain challenging what you see and if you decide to do something that even i don't agree with do it because you wanted to do it don't do it because the crowd did mm -hmm. you know that's something that my dad was really unique in that way um he, he he definitely had his own style and 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 i was able to witness that growing up you know and and so not that i agree with everything that he did but it definitely was 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 something that i that stood out was he was very specific in how he 
did life and what he and the decisions that he made and some of the why that it took me years and some of it I will discover even more later about some of his whys and things that he was challenged with to make the decisions that he's made. You know, so it, it, it definitely that impacted me just being someone that used their own brain um, to make decisions and not feeling like you have to just follow the crowd because that's what everybody's doing. What is something that you know today that you wish you knew when you started? Yeah, I think tied into that question, honestly, I, I think about with the thinking part, I, and this is, this is how I'm wired. I don't think this had anything to do with my dad. I think it's just who I was, how I was born. Yeah, I am an overthinker, you know? <laughs> and, and so I can, I can, can paralyze my own self by, by overthinking. And, and I think I was, uh, I was always the safe kid on the block. So if I was when I was in my late teens and starting to go hang out and had a car, the parents that I was hanging out with their children, if they knew that that I was there, they knew that their kids were going to be good, no matter where we were going, no matter what we we're doing. They knew that like Henry is going to be the safe person. He's going to not drink. He's not going to do anything crazy with the car. He's going to get us back on time. He's going to be, and and a part of me like okay. That's cool, but really not so much when you're young, thinking that that's that's what I'm known for. And, and, and so <laughs> there was this overthinking kind of mentality that I had growing up where I think I I was so structured and, and, and so precise with my decisions and lived in this kind of like box, if you will, that I, I think I might have missed out on a few things in life as a kid or a young kind of a teenager where people are out doing their wild, crazy things and they can tell stories later. I that wasn't me, mm. you know, and I, and I kind of resented it for, to a degree. So I would tell my younger self, um, you know, live a little bit, you, you know, obviously don't do anything that's going to jeopardize your life, but Hey, take some more risk, you know, and I didn't do that till later, but I, I ran into people that crossed my, my path as a, as a, as an adult. Um, one person that I, that, that I was involved with for a while that ended up like saying, let's go jump out of an airplane for your birthday. And, and I, somewhere along the line, I must have said, I want to jump out of an airplane because I don't recall that. <laughs> but I knew that I was told like the night before, we're going to go jump out of an airplane. And I wasn't going to cower down. So we jumped out of an airplane, you know, and it was the That's craziest, wild. Thing, craziest thing, man. And, <laughs> and so I, 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 I loved every moment of it, although I was afraid as I'm signing my life away on the contract. Um, but we did it, you know, and, and I have a recording to prove it. And it was an, an amazing thing. So it helped me step out of like living my latter part of my life. I, I take more risk. Um, I don't necessarily live it all in the lines. Um, but that's what I would tell myself is, is take, take more risk and, and challenge yourself to do more than what you did. Be risky. And I, I mean, I would love to see the face on everybody that heard that you jumped out of a plane is that something that you would recommend for for everybody to do on their bucket list? I absolutely would. I, I think it's something that is so exhilarating. It was 13,000 feet, obviously tandem, um, in this plane that the doors open and you're looking out and you're on this bench and you're scooting, watching the next person before you or, you know, before you go out and you're like, your moment's coming. It's inevitable. And then you're sitting there like, this is the scariest moment is being on the edge of the bench. And <laughs> now you're about to flip over and you have to let you're completely surrendered to your tandem person that is in control. So you have to go with them and you go and you flip, you know, and, and then you do your thing and he's yelling in your ear about, OK, now this is where this is where you start this part of it. And it's, it was it's, it was scary. It was crazy but it was so much fun and so exhilarating. And once you, I mean, it lasts for a minute, you know, and, but it was just an experience that I will never forget. And I definitely would recommend um, anyone to jump out. You don't have to do a thousand, 13,000 feet, but do it. You love it. And you can, you know, live to tell the story. You twisted my arm. I'm going to look into it. I'm going to try it. I definitely, I'll put the video somewhere after I do it and be like, Henry Nutt the third made me do it. <laughs> so, Got to do it, man. That'd be cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So then, going back to your position at Southland Industries, what does pre-construction executive mean? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really kind of a, my job title is what allows me to do my job. But what I do as a pre-con exec is, is, is really business development slash pre-construction, which is we're the ones that are winning the work for the company, you know, for this particular division. Um, we're building relationships. Super important. With, yes. That building relationships with, with our general contractors, our owners, and just the community at large to find out, you know, how do we position ourselves best to surround a project? Is it a good fit? Um, what is important to this project and how do we make ourselves more distinct than the next person, the next company? And, and then getting our teams involved to figure out an approach and execute the work and who are the right people to, to surround this job with us on, on our teams. And so it's ultimately all about that, about identifying opportunities and then pursuing those opportunities that, that fit in our wheelhouse and, and bring you know, profitable revenue to our company. You know? and, and so obviously it's, it's critically important. Um, but the, the, the role and the title that I have as a, as a pre-construction executive was really more so about a title that allows me to do my day job and not get caught up or others getting caught up with, oh, here comes a business development person because I came from the trades. And, mm -hmm. and so I have, as a sheet metal worker, I've been in that for 37 years just about and was a general superintendent here at Southland for 12 of my 17 years. And so I didn't want to, that, to get lost uh, somewhere when I am talking to our, our potential clients about an opportunity and bringing in that expertise or that experience that I've had for more years and it, get lo it gets lost with a title. And so I was in an interview once and one of our GC partners said, hey, why are you here? You know, and one knew <laughs> why, the other one was like, why is a business development guy in our interview? And, and so he gave me some advice and said, hey, you might want to consider changing your title. I know the value you bring, but others will get trapped in that title thinking that you're just a salesperson and you're not going to breathe. just going to tell us what we want to hear. And, and so um, I brought that back to my office, you know, and, and, and said, hey, I, and they said, well, go figure out a name, you know. And <laughs> so, so I did, you know, and, and it, it, it is. And, it's true to the way, you know, I, I am involved in the pre-con part of our job and we have pre-construction manager potentially that I, that I, that I report to, but that title allows me to do my day job. It allows me to kind of speak to people and not have them get caught in, in, in the crosshairs of, of a title, but really understand the value that I bring. So um, we have a great team, so it, it's easy. And so we actually have a pre-con pre manager, and he is uh, responsible for just the, the department. It's a really small group of us. Uh, it, it, then, then I have a direct colleague that does the same thing. And, and then we have a proposal specialist that, that kind of assembles all of our proposals and works with us to make everything look great when it goes out to our clients. And so we're out building relationships, networking with people, um, building trust within the community, trying to, again, distinguish ourselves from our competitors. And, and I get a chance to spend a lot of time, you know, like I said, I was traveling before this, this event here or this um, us meeting and getting a chance to speak uh, to different people about what's important to Southland and, and what's important to me in regards to how we execute, uh, whether it's lean construction and, 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 and focusing on, on field um, leadership and, and productivity improvements and, and people as a whole, you know, and building better cultures in our, in, our, in our projects that help our people have different experiences that are positive in construction because we have a lot of negativity. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of negative publicity in, uh, about our industry. And I'm focused on changing that and, and, and say it's one project and one person at a time. And it's not easy work, but that's something that I've just naturally gravitated towards and now um, speak about it literally all over the country. And it's not about being on the stage for me. It's about being passionate about something that you believe in that so happens to get you on a platform where people want to listen to you. I love what you said. One project, one person at a time. That's a, that's a really powerful statement. You are out there. I mean, you're out there a lot speaking all over the place and going to a lot of events is there any events or like associations that you're a part of that 
stand out where you feel like, you know, they really provided a platform for you to get out there and make a change? Yeah, there's so many, right? Uh, but the one that, that, uh, that Southland has invested in probably the most, so we were founding members of Lean Construction Institute. You know, and so uh, I've been on the board for LCI uh, for almost six years now, and I'll be in my, I'm in my last term, my last year of my second term. And and so uh, I was the chair of it last year. And what wow. a great opportunity, um, been able to, it's not just about Southland, it's very important to us as a company, but it's also recognizing what we're doing for the industry. And mm. so when I got on the stage with, 1600 people or whatever and talking about uh what's important to our organization and what's important to me and a person coming from the field i wanted to identify with that group i want to identify with whether it's a competitor or just an other person in the trades that how do they connect with link construction what does it mean to you in a, more, a very practical way that that in that organization has been very prolific and and and, and my development and being able to impact um, the country when it comes to lean construction and execution and having collaborative behaviors and, and building a culture that, that, that respects people and, and really that, that message of respect for people, what does it really mean? What does it really look like on a job site in an industry that has not been very kind to its people and, and really taking a mantle up in regards to that, and my mentor, uh, his name is Victor Sanvito, he's a senior VP here at Southland. Um, he he recommended do what helps you do your day job when you get a part of this board. Don't just do something that you're checking a box, but do something that's going to help you with your job. And at that time, I was a superintendent, and that's what helped me working with our trade partners and creating a task force that was going to impact uh, that group. So. LCI has been very prolific. Uh, another organization is AGC, which is Associate General Contractors of America, as well as California, um, where we've been able to focus on, on DEI and so diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I was on the, uh, the DNI steering committee um, when it recently was called that uh, for six years as uh, the chair for three of those years and really was instrumental with uh, building uh, campaigns, uh, one in particular is culture of care, mm. and 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 really was emphasized um, building better cultures um, and creating care, you know, on on projects um, that that were instrumental and in, and in, in how people treated each other. Again, on projects that are notorious for not treating people um, equitably. You know, whether it was women or people of color or people from uh, different communities with sexual persuasion, you know, and, and so it's, it's all those things that we normally don't talk about dealing with suicide and alcohol abuse and substance abuse that we're, we're on the wrong side of the metric, you know, when it comes to uh, how we're addressing it. And, and so knowing that there's organizations out there that are really rallying around that. Um, very proud of the work AGC California does. Um, I'm a part of their uh, their board as a VP of specialty contractors, um, getting to, able to do that um, work here specifically in California. But those organizations are, are prolific. And the last one I'll say that recently I just was appointed by the governor of California onto the contractor state licensing board. You know, wow. that's another level of, of impact but to, to, and that's just been since February of this year. And so um, I've been to several, a couple of different meetings, but the impact that we have on every person that holds a license, a contractor's license in California, um, we're trying to protect consumers, you know, mm. and, and, and recognize how we help, because there's lots of, unfortunately, people out there in the industry that are manipulating the consumer and, and essentially stealing money from them. And so um, that work is important, you know? So it's, all these things I would have never thought would have happened in, in my career path. And, and um, it, it's, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, so I get to, to bring that to our, our owners and our GC partners and our teams about our strategy and what we should be considering in addition to all the, the basic things that we have to do to you know, win a job. 
at your speaking engagements when you're talking to the guys in the field? I know that's who you're really relatable with. Has anybody came up to you after the event and was like, man, you said this and it really stuck with me. Um, thank you for bringing it up or anything like that, that any like key takeaways that anybody has brought up to you. It, it happens more often than I even can count. And it's, and sometimes I wonder like, are, are people listening to me? And sometimes it's right away. And sometimes it's after the fact. And sometimes it's on another event. Somebody said, I saw you here and you said this and thank you. You know, mm. and, and I think part of it is when people wonder, well, you know, we didn't go to, I didn't go to school to be a speaker, <laughs> I, I, you know, and, and then some of the stages and people and amount of people on there, you can get like pretty nervous about that. And people would ask me, how, how do you do that? And not get, I get, you know, afraid or whatever. And one, I say, you know, don't think I'm not at times, you know, but I learned <laughs> to do it afraid, right? You got to do it anyway. But, but the, 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 the critical part for me and the most important part of that has been believing in what I, what I speak about. And the moment mm. that, that I get on stage and I'm reading some prompts that I didn't write, or I'm talking about something that I didn't do, it would, it would be like, he's a fraud. <laughs> you know, but no, people would be looking at their phone while they're looking at me partly because it would come across just very disingenuous. And so mm. I, I have learned to, I focus on what I believe in, period. And, and so if I'm talking about it, I've, I've experienced it somewhere, somehow, some way, and, and whether good or bad. And, and I tell that story, whether good or bad, because not everything is rosy. I've had a rough you know, stage even in my career. And I talk about that. I talk about those things, but I also leave with hope. You know, not that I have the end of the story yet even, but I can say that I'm an optimist by nature. And so I'm always gonna be hopeful even in some of those darkest moments. And, and I think people, what I've learned is people have been more encouraged. And these are like superintendent, like, you know, total like masculine guys, you know, that had these moments and they come by and pull me to the side and they're like, hey man, thanks for saying, you know, talking about mental health. Um, mm. or thanks for talking about suicide. Or, or you're just an encouragement, just the fact that you're on the stage and you were that person that came through the trades and you are doing this. You're an example for us. I don't do it for that reason, but when those moments do happen, it reminds me of the platform that I do have and the power behind it um, and to be a voice for some people or just to be an example for some people. And, and, just, and then just being really raw is like as a, as a black man, doing this is even more uncommon, you know? And, and so I, I remember just a couple months ago, I was sitting down talking to a gentleman that works for us and he was just started working for our company and in, in our, in our talent acquisition group. We're sitting at a bar after, after having a, a session, a speaking session out in Chicago. And he was just, I'm just talking. It's like, we're talking. And he's sitting there like, dude, like, like, Somebody should pay you to say this stuff, you know? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sitting there like thinking, I'm just talking common knowledge, things that I know, things that I've experienced, things that I believe in. And he was just saying, this is so rich, you know? And thank you for just taking the time um, to talk to me. And sometimes you're like, hey, I'm just a regular guy. I'm Henry. People around me remind me that all the time, you know? But, and I don't think I'm some big shot at all. I'm just a regular guy, but I'm also very aware that there are people that really appreciate and respect some of the things that I've done that I would have never imagined, um, you know, that these things happening. And, and every once in a while, it's usually when I'm putting together a resume or I have to put some kind of thing together about what I've done. And I look at that and I'm like, whoa, like I did that and I did this thing, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's humbling. You know, because I still don't think I'm a big shot. I'm just a guy, regular guy. I got a, I got a mission. I believe in it. I'm gonna do that. You know, and and doors have opened because of that. But I was a scary, very low confident person for many, many years, and and would rather blend into the back and exit than <laughs> not <laughs> talk to me. Don't ask me a question. I'm shy. All that. You know, but. And, I, and, and by nature, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. So many, many times I get on the stages, but 
I want to go take a nap when it's over because <laughs> I've exhausted all of my energy, you know, and I need to recharge. And people say, no way, you're not an introvert. But yeah, actually, I am. I know how to step up and do what I got to do. But by nature, I'm an, I'm gonna, I want to be by some water in a quiet kind of environment with a couple few people. That's my happy place, you know. But I also know how important it is for me to do this. But my thoughts and those prolific things that I think will come out of my mouth or into my brain happen when I'm alone, you know. Mm. And I just have the courage now to say it and and have the the platform and others to motivate me to say, hey, we want you to do this. And I think as long as you keep it in the perspective that it's not about you, then you can do it, you know. And I don't make this about me. I just do it. When you're going out there and doing these speaking engagements, talking in front of people, you're an introvert, but you're talking very confidently about what you know. It's because you genuinely care. And like, if it, I really appreciate that because I personally feel like I'm a total introvert, but I'll be out there talking to people. And that's because I'm trying to get the same stories and understanding and seeing how I can help too. And we can't help people if we don't know. So we have to ask the right questions, especially at the right time. So even that one individual that came up and told you, hey, man, that was huge what you just said. That could have been timing and you never know it. Like, so it's important for us to speak up when we can, especially about topics that we care about. So I and I want to I want to revert back to like when you were talking about your team. I mean, it sounds like Southland Industries, they do incredible work. Do you use any type of technology in the field to help streamline operations, you know, workflows? Like, how do you utilize technology today? Yeah, it's, it's intricately a part of what we do. And again, working for a very progressive uh, company that believes in its people, knows that, that that is the most important asset that we have. And and our, our largest risk happens in the field. All the pre-work that we do, it really comes down to the execution or the ability to execute in a very proficient and, and, and productive manner. And so we know that technology is critically important to that, you know, and, and so we do invest a lot into how our field leadership and our, our teams out there are, are putting together their plans, um, how, they, how they coordinate with others, how they track um, their ability to know what, where, where they're at like in a, during a project schedule. And one of the one of the ones out that, that comes to mind is this industry has been notorious for keeping information a secret to the people who actually need it. Like, what is your budget for for a particular scope of work? You know, how much time was allocated in the estimate for me to install a certain part of my job? You know, on this during this during this project schedule, and and you don't know really if you're doing well or if you're doing great. You don't really have a way to measure that. Many times as field leaders, you just go do the job and and feel like, hey, I thought I think I did good today. And you might have, you might not have. And so one of the things that that we that we do here is is we have this uh, this tool that allows us to 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 see our actual productivity and understand what our budget is for those buckets of money that are put away for the different scopes of work. Some are very complex and some are very simple. But our field leaders will get a chance to, to see that in real time. Hey, here's what your budget is for this, this scope of work that you're going to be responsible for. You're going to build your crew. Here's where we think maybe are some of the issues or challenges. And, and then it gives that, that, that field leader an opportunity to to strategize or come up with ideas or who to collaborate with or figuring out ways to, to make it better. But what has happened in this industry for years in the way that I was raised in it was if you tell that person how many hours they have, they're going to they're gonna abuse it. Mm. And what we've learned is that if that is a person you have on your crew, then it's the wrong person. But if you tell somebody that they have X amount of hours, one of those real leaders are going to say, how do we beat it? And are going to come up with a with a plan to beat that because that's just our competitive nature is 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 to win, you know. And, and so we no longer thought about we can't tell them because they'll abuse it. We we think about we have to let them know so they understand it so they can protect it, like like it's theirs. Because we treat our field leaders like 
you're an entrepreneur. This is this project is your business. Run it like it's your business. You mm. know, you're responsible for it. And whether it's a small portion of it or a large portion of it, treat it like it's your business and execute your work accordingly. And so whoever you have to coordinate with, whether it's another trade or a general contractor or your own team, we want to make sure people know that they have that autonomy to, to do their job. And some technology will help us identify um, some of those issues and how we plan and coordinate. And we're sitting in big rooms and coordinating these massive projects that will go for four to five years and a year of planning. You know, all those decisions that we're making, we need some technology to help us um, to execute that in the most efficient way. And so, again, not something we went to school for, but we train. And, and so we help develop our people and get used to technology. And every, every field leader has, is going to have either an iPad or a laptop with technology on it that's going to help them execute their job, period. And so we don't leave it and say, here's your laptop. Like you used to get a set of drawings and say, OK, here's your drawing. Here's your address for the job site. Good luck. No, we actually are going to help and sit down with you and be intentional about training and development and, and learning how to use different software because it's not what you did. It's not how you normally did your job, but now it is essential. And it's an expectation even from some owners or general contractors that you will use this particular piece of software. And they'll train us, but we want to make sure that our people are, are prepped, at least in the foundational stuff, and can come to the table with having the basics um, like in their, in their tool belt. So technology plays a huge part. I think it has to be a, a balance of it because you can be you know, you can try to overcompensate with technology, but if you don't have the culture to execute it, it's like having this dynamic piece of technology or say you got this this piece of equipment that can change the world. Now you got to do is plug it in for it to work. But if you have this piece of technology that you can't plug in, it's just a like a big paperweight. It serves nobody any good. And, and so we have to be practical with technology and making sure that it's going to bring the, the value that we want it to bring. But we, we, we need to make sure that we're training our people to be able to utilize it in the most proficient way and that it actually solves their problems. So some of the, the buy-in needs to come from the people who are using it, not from the salesperson who bought it. Yeah, you know, and, and so we got to make sure that you know we're partnering even with technological companies to say, hey, what you're developing, here's what you need to think about so that we actually want to use it and then it's helping our team solve their problems in the field, um, you know, proficiently. And, and, and so it's a key part of what we do. And, and again, again, something that that we didn't do many, many years ago, but it's an essential component um, that we have to have. It's like we would have a hammer in our tool belt. I like the way that you articulated that. It sounds like Southland Industries has a very strong foundation for their workforce management platform and how they train their employees. Awesome. Absolutely, a absolutely. It's a it's an investment. I, I used to use this uh, this 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 um, blurb that I saw on LinkedIn once, and it was a CFO and a CEO talking about training, and the CEO tells the CFO, "Hey, what if we train them and they leave?" And the CFO looks back and says, well, what if we don't train them and they stay, you know? <laughs> and so you, you think about it, like, do I want a bunch of untrained people that are probably creating problems in my company and training on any kind of level, whether it's technology or behaviors or management or leadership, it's an investment though. You got to be able to invest in, in your people and it's going to cost you something, but it's going to cost you more if you don't do it. A little bit about Southland Industries and feel free to share what Southland Industries is all about, and then also where are they located, where can people find them, and where do they do business? Yeah, so Southland is a national company. Um, you know, so we we are across the United States. I used to say we have six divisions, but we've grown that, outgrown that many, many years ago. Uh, I'm in Northern California, but we so we have a division here in Northern California, Southern California. Um, and Southwest, so in Arizona and Vegas, uh, Philadelphia, uh, we're in Dallas with our, with our, our company under the, under the name seal of Brent um, USA, which is a part of Southland now uh, in Dallas there in San Antonio and Houston area and Mid-Atlantic. Um, 
So we are across what we call like the smile of the United States um, and, and growing and doing uh, projects across more uh, states across the United States. So we are the, let's see, we are the largest privately held uh, mechanical contractor in the United States. Um, we probably have about this year will be just under maybe $3 billion in, in, in revenue with about 6,600 employees overall. Um, but we're a design build firm that, that, that has engineering staff, controls, uh, energy, service, and obviously the HVAC, um, MEP, you know, work that we do. So uh, we, we do work in mission critical, healthcare, higher ed, um, life sciences, um, we'll, we do it, you know, we, we, we like to tackle complex projects. We love doing design build work because we feel like we bring value to our owners and GC partners um, by having that in-house capability to take a complex project and, and really design it to, in the most proficient way with the end user in mind. Um, mm -hmm. We, we have cross learning across our divisions. So all our divisions with their own shops and, and uh, capabilities that we're able to learn from each other. And we, we, we've done some of the largest, largest hospitals um, in, the, in the country as, as well as data centers. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, in my 17 years here, it, it's been such an amazing transition for me uh, to come here one day as a, as a general superintendent you know, and to, to be able to grow and, and to learn as I have and to be very proud of what we what we do. And, and this company has stretched me and, and but also given me like the access to, to do it. We, we put a lot of emphasis on training. I wasn't here probably a month and I was in a training for a week and got sent to but back then was like our corporate office in SoCal and there for a week with other my peers across the company. Um, sitting down with our executives uh, and being taught about one who Southland is and then where do you fit in Southland and really helping you understand that you really are valued here and, and we're going to invest in you in this way, not only to show you that, but to help build your career and, and want you to take a responsibility and an ownership. Um, uh, we also are, you know, a, a, a company that, that has that where, where I'm a part owner of, the, of this company now, you know, and that was, that's been several years now where you have this opportunity. And I was as a superintendent where I was able to take part in that, you know, so, so it's been a lot of opportunity here and, and just the progressive thinking uh, of our, of our CEO, Ted Lynch on down um, to really make this company a place where it's a destination where people want to come to work because we actually do care. Um, we're not a perfect company, but I, I feel like in my experience, we're one of the better ones for sure in regards to how we treat people, um, how we execute work, how we want to address the problems that our owners have and our GC partners have, and, and we want to solve problems. We are experts in the crafts that, that we um, are, you know, that we, that we uh, are under our umbrella. And, and we have a lot of smart people in this company a lot of people that care um, and, and want to create different experiences and, 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 and break some of those negative stereotypes and statistics that exist in this industry. And the only way we do that is by really creating an environment where we allow people to actually have a different experience. Because it's not about what you say, you know, hey, we want to be a great company. Okay, well, you got to do it. And, and that's going to last longer and, and be more impactful if you can have a job that's that's potentially adversarial or very complex and challenging, doesn't mean that every day you go to work, you have to have this contentious environment. So we want to be a part of work that has integrated project delivery kind of type focuses, you know, where it's a team environment where you're, you're, you're bound together, maybe even contractually, or you just have an obligation to help each other win. And that has not been the mentality of this industry. It's about who gets in first wins and screw the other person. And that's the loudest, the loudest person, the, the biggest jerk wins. And that's the one who makes the most noise is the winner. That's been the mentality. And it's still like that, like probably more than it's not. But being in a company like Southland, you get a chance to say, here's what's possible when you tap into one, the talent pool that you have and not just the person in the corner office has, has, 
has to have the smartest ideas. It's every blend, but you got to tap into those people. You got to ask them questions. You got to get them involved. You got to help them see that their voices do matter. And, and those are the things that I think are prolific with Southland and how we're able to impact the industry and then give people better experiences. Because when they have that, they're thinking like, like, how do we do this again? And even if they go to work for another company, they're gonna think about that experience and say, I want that to happen here. And it's not as easy just to say you want it. It actually definitely takes work and people that are committed to the effort, um, but we're committed to the effort. And, and, and like I say, we want our folks to think like entrepreneurs and, and not wait for someone that's to tell them what to do. We want them to see some issues and say, well, how do I solve that? How, I'm empowered to make something happen here. And, and I think that's the, one of the most prolific, impactful things that we do is that it doesn't matter who you are. If you have an opinion, we want to hear it. We want to figure out not everyone's going to work, but we want to at least want to hear it and figure out how we can execute or implement that. Southland Industries has an amazing culture. They've created a safe place for almost anybody. And if I were new to construction, I might want to explore some opportunities there. That's what it definitely sounds like. So I'll segue that into my next question uh, before we wrap up. Do you have any advice for anyone new in construction? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think it's like, one, if you if you've done any kind of study or research and you look at construction and just looks like this this industry that is just has licensed bad behavior, because <laughs> it, it has you know all these all these negative things that that can look it could be very daunting, you know what am I going to get myself into here? Um, like with anything, I'd say if it's construction that you want to be a part of and it's such a dynamic field, so many different areas that you can go into, is um, is believe in yourself is, is really believe in yourself and your capability and, 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 and have a great attitude. Um, come with a willingness to, to learn, to be eager, um, know how to be a friend or a trustworthy partner so that people want to invest in you. You don't have to know everything. And especially coming from the trades. I mean, our whole model as an apprentice is, is a, is a, is a younger person, that didn't know anything, but someone wanted to put their arm around them, you know, essentially, um, and say, hey, let me show you how to do this. Because they wanted to pass that knowledge down to that next generation. In part, that next generation was going to be the key to them having an, a retirement. <laughs> you know, with them, with their work was going to feed into their pension. You know, and so there's some, you know, self, you know, kind of goal in that, as well but it, but it's really about knowing that we have to pass the baton but we have to pass the baton to someone that's worthy and mm -hmm. and so i say know who you are be confident in your capabilities don't be overwhelmed by someone who's had years of experience because you don't know their journey and and you need to like step up and where you're at and not feel um, like you should compare yourself to someone who's got 10, 20, 30 years on you. You shouldn't be like them, but be confident in you. And that's the one thing that I feel will separate you from other people. When I was just getting into this trade, my career, my career became a career when I changed myself. And I was able to change myself and I became aware of what the obstacles I was creating for myself. And it was my mindset. And I took initiative one day and I stepped out into something that I wasn't 100% sure I should do, but I knew enough to say I could make this decision. I did that and my foreman at that time recognized a leadership capability in me and it literally changed my entire trajectory of my career. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it wouldn't have happened if I did not take that initiative. So I'd say don't be afraid, be confident, take those risks. That is great advice. And thank you for being a guest on our show. Please, everyone, like, subscribe, comment, and share the Builder Upper Show with anyone in the construction industry. 
We will see you next time. Thank you. If you're a construction contractor and would like to appear as a guest on our podcast, write us an email. It's lou at lumberfy.com.